Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For, she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Laha Ro. It is said there between Kaddish and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So one thing that I get in Europe that I really don't get in America, I mean, it exists in America, but it's just not the same sort of thing, is uh, football. And I love, love football. In fact, Uh, I'm told that, as I say I love football, there's a whole host of non-football people that go, oh no, not another football, (laughs) not another football uh, introduction or or illustration. But I I love football, and and might I say that I think we have the best football in the world here, Uh, okay? I think it's the best. I I really do. Uh, Hands down, the best. Um, And um, one of the things that's very interesting is there is a person here in the UK who has been basically responsible for all of the strategy that is played out in football all over the world. Uh, And they play, uh, they're a manager here, and I don't know if anybody knows who this is, it's Marcelo Bielsa, uh, who leads, leads United, that doesn't roll off the tongue, leads, leads United, uh, Marcelo Bielsa. And so everyone basically has looked over what he has come up with. And, and in some sense, this has gotten into all the different football styles. So it doesn't matter if you're Jurgen Klopp or you know who you are, uh, Ponticino. They all have been kind of inspired by this guy. And they have their own thing, but they always pull something from him. And uh, he plays here in, uh, here in the UK. Now, uh, one thing that is interesting about Marcelo, besides the fact that he loves football more than anybody else on Earth, um, is that he is absolutely terrified of flying. Absolutely terrified of flying. 
Uh, and so his car, he regularly uh, clocks up about 25,000 miles in driving uh, because he does not want to get on a plane. And so while his team just flies somewhere, he gets in his vehicle and he drives because the notion of being 3,000 miles up in the air in a tin can being directed by something else Somehow that's less comforting, and it's basically rockets, attached to rockets, right? Uh, attached to, to these uh, giant uh, fuel systems. That, that seems a lot less safe than being right here on the ground, right? And uh, you control your fate. Your foot is on the pedal. It's me in the driver's seat. And so people think uh, it would be much safer and much better for me to be, what, to be driving, yeah? Than, than to put my trust in, in, in flying. But guess what? Flying is infinitely safer than driving. <laughs> infinitely safer. You're much, 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 much less likely to have a, an accident of any sort uh, flying. It's 99.99999% safe. It's very, very safe. At driving, not safe so much. Most of us have had tiny fender benders here and there. Um, and some of us have had real accidents. And so uh, it's a really great picture of how we struggle with trust. We struggle with trust because, see, on the ground I have control. I, I, I direct this vehicle. But, but if you're in the air and somebody else is totally in control of your destiny, and that just doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. And the hardest thing to trust, the very hardest thing to trust is God's promise. The very hardest thing to trust is God's promise for you uh, for salvation. We're always trying to add a little bit on just to make sure we're okay. We're always trying to say, God, yeah, you can save me, but look, I have, I have good proof that saving me would be the right thing to do. Uh, you know, God, God you, could, you could save me, but I don't even know if I need that, really. I've, I've done a pretty good job. We, we always want that extra thing. We want to be in the driver's seat. Now, as we look at Abram and Sarai here in today's text, uh, they have this huge promise that they feel like God's not going to deliver on this. We have to help God. We got to help God get to where we're going here. Yeah, yeah, he's got a promise and the promise is going to come true, but uh, we're going to take this into our own hands. And guess what? They make a royal mess of it. <laughs> They make a royal mess. It's such a big mess that we can open up our paper today and still see the mess played out. We'll get to that in just a moment. <laughs> and so what they're telling us is this. The best way to live life is in complete trust to the Lord. The best way that you can live life, the only way that leads to heaven, is to live life in complete trust in the Lord. Uh, trust in him for his promise. Or you'll not receive his promise. Let's step into the story by first seeing Abraham and Sarai and how they want to help God in his work, but it's a, it's a colossal mistake. And so this is going to be chapter 16, and we're going to be starting in verse 1. It says this, Now Sarai, and Abraham's, uh, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave or my servant, it's probably a better translation there, my servant, perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. Uh-oh, this is weird. What a strange thing is going on here. Now, here's the backstory, and we know it already. God promised Abraham he would make him a great nation. How many years ago? 25 years ago, God said to Abraham, in Ur, in the city, you're not doing so well at making a name for yourself. Go, I'll make a great name for you. Now, Abraham left and he almost made it to the promised land, but then he stopped kind of short of the border and he waited for his dad to pass away. And then God reappeared to him and said, go now by yourself and I'll make you a great nation again. So he reiterates that. Now they've been in the land 11 years. Sarai is 75 years old. <laughs> and then God just now reiterates to, to Abram, oh, oh, by the way, you're going to have a child. It's not going to be someone you adopt. It's going to be from your own flesh. Now, that's important, that word flesh. What God is saying, and Sarai and Abraham both get this, 
He's saying, remember marriage, when you have marriage, you have the, the two, and they come together and they become one flesh. He's saying, you two there, you two are going to have a child. But that seems very unlikely. <laughs> that seems very unlikely. In fact, Sarai's words are, God is stopping me from having a child. You can hear the kind of the distrust. That's a weird situation that we now have going on. They believe in God, but now they distrust God. Have you ever been in that kind of relationship with God? I believe you, but I don't trust you. I believe you, but I kind of half struggle with you. And, and in this state of desperation, they hatch a plan. They've been waiting on God's promise, but nothing happens. Time to take matter into our own hands. H have you been there? H have you prayed for something? H have you been asking the Lord for something? Lord, Lord, help me to be a certain way. Lord, hel help me to change. Lord, help this person to, to, meet, to meet you. H help me to, 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 to reach out to that person. Hel help this situation to change, Lord. A and nothing happens. Or you feel like nothing is happening, at least. And, and you begin to say, gosh, there is no use to this at all. What use is this? Well, that's very natural. And so they hatch this plan, and she says, take my maid Hagar, go to her, have a child, we'll adopt, well, half adopt, the child will be yours, but I'll be the mom. And, and this idea was actually kind of a weird system. We have surrogacy here, but that, because of our ability to uh, you know, put the genes into uh, an embryo, it is, it is both the parents. This is surrogacy of the ancient world, essentially. Uh, and, and so uh, this is detailed all over the ancient world. There's a, a, a set of legal documents called Hammurabi's Code. And in Hammurabi's Code, it speaks of this particular activity, giving, uh, if you are well-to-do, you know, and you're important, and you had servants, you could tell the servant, hey, is this a good idea? We'll have a child through you. And they could agree to that, and you could have this child and then to carry on the name, because the ancient world um, saw marriage in a totally different light than the Bible. The Bible is revolutionary in what it says about marriage. The, the ancient world said, marriage, you're welcome to sleep with whoever you want if you're a man. You go out and have a great time, sleep with whoever you want, but then you should have a wife too. She can't sleep with anybody but you, because you got to make sure those kids are yours. And so they, they made marriage about passing on your line and making sure that uh, that child was yours. That, don't let the child be somebody else's. That, that's what they made it about. But the Bible makes marriage about companionship. The Bible makes marriage about companionship. It's to, it's to be not alone. And, and, and children are, are a part of that, but that, that's not the main thing here. It, it's really about companionship. And so this is the idea. They're just going along with culture. This is what they tell us to do. Let's do this. Let's do this. That the world says go for that, but not God. God thinks that this is not good, and we think it's not good too. I mean, let's just dig through this. Uh, first off, where did this Hagar lady come from? Where did she come from? Anyone know? Egypt. When did uh, Abraham go to Egypt? <laughs> oh, remember that fiasco? He went down there, and he's like, hey, this is Sarai, my sister, right? And they're like, oh, we like your sister. Here's some gifts. Here's some sheep. Here's some cows. Uh, you can even have some servants. Guess who comes into Abraham's retinue in Egypt? Hagar. In fact, Hagar's name sounds kind of like the sojourn, like that episode where Abram went and sojourned down in Egypt. That's what he got, this lady. Hmm, that doesn't sound like somebody that should just be sold off like that. Here's a, here's a gift, a person. Is that right? <laughs> Is that how things should go? People just hand it off like property? I mean, but what a picture, right? Sin returning in your life. You had an earlier sin. You think it's in the past. Oh, but it becomes an opportunity for another sin in the present. It's not one time. And look, they totally break the marriage covenant that is outlined in Scripture. And we talked about this in Genesis. The idea is the triune God has created something 
that looks like himself. And what is that thing? It's these complements, the man and the woman together becoming one flesh, and we call that union marriage. But now they're saying, hmm, that's not really important. We can have this, and we can add Hagar, and in a bit he's going to add another wife. We can have just one guy, but like six women or whatever, and that, that'll be great. We'll have lots of children that way. And God looks at that, and he says that is not what marriage is about. Marriage is about the relationship that the father has to the son Uh, to the spirit throughout all eternity. It's about companionship. What have they made marriage and what have they made lovemaking about? Just procreation. That's it. Just just get a child. That's the bottom line, they say. Now, interesting, uh, we wouldn't say that that's the bottom line today of marriage. But we've we've cheapened. We've cheapened lovemaking. We've, We've not made it about being in community with your spouse. Uh, we've made it about, well, just have fun with whoever, whoever is willing. That's great. And that, that's a travesty. That is a travesty because it, it, it dishonors God. It dishonors his heart. It dishonors his very identity. And this is why this is such a big issue in our culture. We say, oh, the, the church is so terrible. No, no, God, his love, it's so beautiful. It's beautiful. Don't mess that up. Uh, many of us have some repenting to do in this area. That it is the way of things, that we might have repenting in this area. Yeah? Okay. Oh, look, they're treating Hagar like property. This is terrible. Who asked her if she wanted this? They just, here you go. Uh, and we're going to find out that the answer is she didn't want that. <laughs> uh, Abraham, it says here, he listened to his wife. Uh, caveat, it's generally a good idea to listen to your wife. I encourage you always to listen to your wife. But... Uh, When you hear what your wife says, right, and when you're talking about the future, your decision should go through what God wants. What does God say? That's interesting. What what do you think God wants here? Uh, And actually, when it says he listened to his wife, that reminds us in the garden, Adam and Eve, they're just kind of hanging out. God's not around. Eve starts eating the fruit because she's prompted to. Adam listens to his wife, it says, and he eats the fruit, doesn't consult God, doesn't say, wait, let's think about our father who created us. And it was a disaster, wasn't it? So if you had to stop, right, what would be good in this situation is if they just sat down and said, let's think about this for a moment. Is this really what God wants? We can all say, is this what God wants? No, it involves a lot of sin. That's a problem. When you're trying to accomplish God's will, but it involves dehumanizing people, violating his marriage covenant, um, it, 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 it becomes clear, and you could ask him if this is what you want. And, and so we're, we want to put the brakes on this. Now look, let's uh, read Galatians 3.3. 3. There's an interesting verse on this, Galatians 3.3. 3. Aha, here we go. 3.3 3 says this. Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Are you beginning to, you've begun in the spirit. Are you going to now finish in the flesh? So what Abraham has going on is that God appeared to him and said, you're not really going anywhere and you won't on your own, but I will make you a great name. I will take care of you. I will save you. And Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. But now he's in the pit of that. And he says, I better take matters into my own hand. And he starts to try to do it in the flesh. And if it didn't work before, it definitely doesn't going to work now. Okay, that's what happens here. And it won't work for us either. Okay, the most obnoxious people I know are not the atheists. They're not people who are just uh, on the street who don't know God. It's Christians who have gotten into the the frame of mind that they need to be uh, a, a picture of righteousness and they need to save themselves. And so they're self-righteous, and it is so terrible. There's nothing worse than a self-righteous Christian. It's just obnoxious. You all know somebody like this. Hopefully, you're not somebody like this. Yeah, you, We know people like this, and we just go, oh, stop trying to save yourself, and just accept what God has done for you, and you'll be a lot nicer and a lot more fun to be around. Trusting God wholeheartedly is what we need, because look at this rubbish victory that we have here. Verse 4, the rubbish victory. 
He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abraham, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave into your arms or into your bosom, into your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do to her whatever you think best. Then Sarah ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. So she fled from here. Um, <laughs> we're so brutally successful. <laughs> what a rubbish victory we have here. It's like we've succeeded so terribly. We got what we wanted. We have a child. Uh, there's been a pregnancy. Brilliant. Job done. Well done, lads. Nope. <laughs> Hagar doesn't think I'm the surrogate. She thinks I'm a childbearing wife, and this woman over here is not a childbearing wife. And how, what a joke she is. And she begins to loathe her. Ancient perspective says to Sarai, you're the problem. You're cursed. You're no good. Because obviously now it's pretty clear who can't have the child. And she's feeling all of the waves of that humiliation the culture saying, you don't belong, you're no good, the gods are against you. And it's just beating her up. And so she goes angrily now to Abraham and says, this is all your fault. And what does that sound like? It sounds like the Garden of Eden. Remember the blame game there? The same thing is happening there now. She goes and says, this is your fault. You, you're, you're responsible. And I love this. Abraham goes, oh, what? And then he just goes, do whatever you want. That's what he says. Do whatever you want with her. I, I'm not responsible for this. This is, this is not my... Just go ahead. Do whatever you want. Wow, Abraham. That's so loving and kind toward Hagar. This person that you gave no choice. You're so sweet. And then Sarah gets her revenge. She's treating her badly. We don't know the specifics. And then Hagar flees the whole scene like Adam and Eve fled from the Lord's presence when they realized that they were naked. And so it's like the, it's, the, it's the Garden of Eden all over again. It's the fall all over again. It, it's a disaster all over again. Uh, that's what happens. And here's the conclusion. Could these people possibly be believers? That's what we are brought to. We look at this and we go, wait a minute. Those are the, those are the fathers and mothers of our faith? Really? They're doing that? Yes. And the, the purpose is, is this is what self-righteousness does. When, when we take matters into our own hands, we just end up looking like people who don't know God at all. Now, now what have Abraham and Sarah really done? They just put more faith in themselves than in God's promise. That's, that's what's going on. It, it really is about us at the end of the day. And, and look at the devastating results. And so let's not go this direction. Let's not succeed miserably. Have you guys seen people who have succeeded miserably? You know, they got what they wanted, but it's not nice. Now here it is for us to look at. So let's consider how God is going to bring compassion into this situation and mercy, uh, but only just, but only just. Um, so this is verse seven now. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where are you going? Or where are you come from? Where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress. Submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant. You'll give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery. Ishmael means God has heard. Okay? God has heard. He will be a, a wild donkey of a man. His hands will begin, uh, be against everyone. Everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You're the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees after me. That's why the, the well was called Ber Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So um, let's start with what Hagar does. Hagar is in a lot of danger. Okay, she's pregnant. She's now just about to enter the desert that is going to lead from 
Sinai to Egypt. She's trying to go home. There's a, a well before the big push. Now, later on, you're going to find out she gets back to that well in about 15 years' time. And then she starts out on the journey, and she can't find anything. And she sits down and says, now I'm going to die. Okay, she probably, if she kept on on this track, she probably is going to her death. So she's very upset. She's run off. I'm not going to be part of the family. And now she's in the middle of the desert and a place that she shouldn't be. As a woman, she's alone. That's not safe. That's not safe at all. Okay. And there she encounters the messenger of the Lord who wants to be compassionate here. Okay. Who is this messenger? Who is this messenger? Well, Hagar says, I've seen God. And so the messenger is... God, but that's a problem. Why are they calling the messenger God? Why aren't they just saying God appeared to her? And the short answer is, is that we'll find all over Genesis, we see this trinity, okay, this trinity. Uh, we see the messenger of the Lord, we see the spirit working, and we see God the Father above, we see it throughout. And here we have what might likely be a, a, the pre-incarnate Christ um, appearing to, to Hagar. And he's coming with questions. Questions are good, aren't they? God shows up and he asks us questions. He wants to know what's going on. Where are you going? Where have you come from? This is a great question to ask whenever you're doing, well, anything really. Should I be doing this? Where am I going? Where, where am I coming from? Is, is this really reflective of, of, of a servant of God? Now, the, the messenger comes and the result is that he, he sends the Hagar back. And the child is going to be able to grow up in Abram's house. So his young childhood is going to be in Abraham's. Tell, tell about the year 14 years old, okay? He's going to live in Abram's house. And so the whole point of this section, if you're wondering what is this about, the whole point is to say God, God's blessing of salvation is available to all. That's, that's the point of this section. So we're going to walk through that in a second. But that's what I want you guys to get. God's salvation is available to anyone and everyone. So let's walk through that. First, we know later in history that the Egyptians mistreat the Israelites, yeah? But here, the Israelites, that's Abraham and Sarai, are mistreating Egypt. That's Hagar. You see what's going on here? And God speaks to this. He says, I have seen your suffering. When the tables are reversed, God says, no, I've seen your suffering too. And he says, call the child Ishmael, which means the Lord has heard my suffering. The Lord has heard. And so what God is saying is, I care for everyone who is suffering. I love everyone who's suffering. It doesn't matter if you're the, the, the promised person through who Christ is going to come, or if you're somebody else. I do not uh, take partiality. And that's an important note for us. It's going to be important when we get to talking about current events in a minute here. God is not partial. He shows grace to all. Look, he appears to a foreign woman. That's what's going on here, a foreign woman. Well, women didn't make it into any of the ancient writings at all. They weren't important. Nobody even mentioned them. Uh, God appears to a foreign woman, someone who is outside the covenant, who is a foreigner, and, and, that just, and he appears just like he appeared to Abraham, right? That, that's what's happening. Abraham got an appearance. So does Hagar. Abraham get, gets a promise. Your child will become a great nation. So does Hagar. Hagar gets a promise. Your child will become a great nation. Abraham is called to repentance, leave your old life, leave your old world, and come after me, and I will bless your name. Okay, here, all the words of repentance are hidden in. It says, go back. That word, go back, means repent. Go back, repent. And then it says, submit, and that word, submit, means humble yourself. Humble yourself. And we know that that's what defines believers. Believers are people who turn back to God, who they, re they repent of their sins, they humble themselves under the Lord, they, they, they give their lives back to the Lord, and God saves them. And look, she responds in faith. She names God. She says, the seeing God has seen after me, and I've seen him. It, it's kind of, the idea is, there's a lot of like little idols, but I've just run into a God who's real, who has eyes in his head, okay? And I know he's watching me. And I trust him. And so she's actually the first convert in the Bible. Okay, that's what is here. She is the first convert in the Bible. The first uh, person who is outside the family of faith, who is now coming into the family of faith, 
Uh, but, but, but God's statement is everyone can have this salvation. So the, he's going to do something very special in Abraham, but this salvation is for all people. It's for all people. So God restores Hagar, but guess what? They, it's just, it's just barely. They, there are lasting repercussions. There are lasting, they are lasting to this day. Uh, and there are lasting repercussions to you choosing to live in, 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 your, in your flesh. There are, there are lasting repercussions for you going home and saying, I'm not giving everything to God. I'm going to do it my way, and I'll go and see God when I need him. That's a typical thought. Typical thought. Sunday is the day where I talk to God again, and if there's anything that needs to be ironed out, then we'll iron it out then. But I don't need him during the week. God says that that lifestyle and that thinking leads to disaster, long-term disaster. And, and so here, God also says, listen, your child is going to be, uh, he is going to be uh, to himself a bit. He's going to be like a warrior, and his family is not going to get along with him, and there's going to be constant conflict. And would you believe that to this very day, that this week, in fact, there has been conflict between the children born through Hagar, that's Ishmael, and through the children born through Sarai, that's going to be Isaac, the two children of promise. Ishmael and Isaac are fighting right now in the Middle East in Israel. That is what is going on. It is a big, actually, uh, Ishmael is fighting uh, Isaac, right? It, it is a mess, but it all goes back here. The family's broken. There's fighting all along the road, and even to this day, there is fighting in the family of faith. If you want to know the genetics of the people in Israel and the genetics of the people who are in Israel who are Arabs, okay, so you have the Jewish and the Arabs, if you were to look at that genetics, you would see that they have common ancestry. And it's still that way to this day. They are, they are family, and they are fighting. And that's because Abraham and Sarai took matters into their own hands. And eventually it's going to get fixed. And you know how it's going to get fixed? God's love is going to be apparent. And it is going to bring together through Christ reconciliation. So that is a coming day. But that is not today. And that's sad. So you guys can keep that in prayer. It's going, it is going on to this very day. And if you'd like to ask about the Gen X stuff, I'll tell you more about that later. How I know exactly where, where these two groups come from. Okay, so God restores Hagar. There's these consequences. The big idea here, the best way to live is in complete trust to the Lord. The best way to live is in complete trust to the Lord. What do we get from this section? Well, we want to ask the question, what is animating my behavior? What is animating my behavior? The problem for Abraham, not that what they did, but they did something that God was not doing. They did not join with God in what he was doing. They did their own thing. And so it's important for us, another verse for you guys to think about, Romans 14, 23, I'll just say it here. It says, everything that is not of faith is sin. That's what it says. Everything that is not of faith is sin. And it's important for us as we go about the things that we do in life. Abraham is a believer. Sarai is a believer. This isn't about salvation. This is about getting off topic with God and doing things that he would not have us do because we're doing our own story, and this is about our own satisfaction, uh, uh, salvation. And this is the unsatisfactory salvation. And so tomorrow you could go and say, I'm a Christian, and go and do things that are not God's will. You're not joining with him, you're doing your own thing. And it could lead to disaster. And so we need to be asking ourselves, as we do what we do, is this the Lord's will? Is this what he wants? Is he pleased with this? And then we join with his salvation effort. We join with his salvation effort. And God is saving the world. He's doing it through love. You can join that. You can be part of the love that is expressed to the world. But you cannot be the love that is expressed to the world. That's God's part. And you can wait on God's promise. And you don't have to be self-righteous, right? You don't have anything to prove anymore. You can say, I I'm waiting on the promise and I want to invite people into that promise. That's a good way to spend your life. A bad way to spend your life is to say, I have it all together and I go to church on Sunday and I tell everybody that. And I show everybody that I'm a good person and everybody goes, Ugh, not that guy again. <laughs> That's what they do. Let's be children that go with God's promise. Let's pray.